Welcome to the Tesla Power Podcast. This is where we're building the Tesla Energy community. We're covering solar panels, solar roof, power wall for your home. I'm Aaron Brady, and today let's talk about solar roof supply chain. Let's talk about the future of the solar roof, and let's talk about a solar powered proto Mars colony, and a lot more. Let's do it. So as per usual, we'll kick off the pod with community input. You can participate in several ways. You can leave a comment below. You can link your YouTube videos. You can call 203-816-5150, or you can email teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. For those that are bold, record an unlisted video question in the YouTube app. Send a link, and I'll put your video question in the show. So first up, Bob gives us an overview on solar roof supply chain and its capabilities of his system in particular. Let's read it. Quote, solar roof supply chain. Uh, I had a 15.7 kilowatt solar roof installed by Tesla in South Florida, Palm Beach County. In the last quarter of 2021 with the PTO a little over a month ago, the PV tiles are made in Buffalo and the power walls are made in Nevada. But the non-PV tiles, the metal tiles, all the various metal trim pieces, the MCIs, and all the DC jumper wiring came from China. I have a Tesla backup switch in a second meter cabinet and no gateway. Um, we have two Powerwall Plus and one Powerwall Two. I have an electric house and a Model X. Uh, I have an all-electric house, sorry, and a Model X. And in March, the roof generated 2.27 megawatt hours. Wow. Uh, the net meter was installed on March 3rd, and since then, I have consumed 53 kilowatt hours from the grid and sent back 900 kilowatt hours to the grid, almost a megawatt hour. That's crazy. End quote. So thank you for the view on the supply chain. You know, it's really remarkable how much of our supply chain links through China. As long as the world's humming along, uh, no issue. Uh, I do see, though, that we're not talking about high technology bottlenecks, right? We're talking about bibs and bobs. We're talking about, you know, just little things holding everything up. So surely Tesla will start to localize this and not just, um, you know, to reduce the pl supply chain risk, but also it'll green that supply chain and potentially even lower the cost if they're able to, you know, automate, scale those parts. But crazy times we live in for sure. And for the consumption part, um, your system wow it produces a lot you have a huge advantage being in a temperate climate uh, without having to heat your home specifically uh, you can keep all of your consumption you know way down even without or even though you have that electric car so you point out uh you're generating i think 53 kilowatt hours from the grid uh, or you're pulling 53 kilowatt hours from the grid even though you're sending nearly a megawatt back to the grid so I presume this means you might benefit from a fourth power wall so that you're able to keep more of your uh, your consumption local, right? Keep from having to export that uh, production, but using it locally. And if I count correctly, you had three total. So does that seem right, right? Maybe adding a fourth power wall would be helpful. But I'm interested to hear how your production keeps up with consumption over the summer. Uh, presumably, um, you know, running the AC should take more electricity, but you'll be producing more, so... You know, not sure how that's going to pa uh, balance out. Not ahead of time anyway, so keep us posted, and congratulations on your solar roof. All right, next up, we've got Randy. He notes um, that um, he's got an overview of his Tesla solar project, and he's got a prediction for the future. So let's check this out. Quote, thanks for all your effort. I've learned a great deal from your podcast. Permit me to provide an overview of my Tesla experience. A year ago, I ordered a Tesla solar roof and batteries for my more than 100-year-old Craftsman-style San Diego home. Though communicating with Tesla was difficult, I was ultimately able to navigate the process of upgrading the bones of my roof and installing a beautiful 15.6 kilowatt solar roof and three power walls. We got PTO from SDG e in February and the system works great. I routinely draw more than 60 kilowatt hours per day and can generate more than 80 kilowatt hours on sunny winter days. It was a very expensive undertaking, which is unlikely to pay for itself for at least 20 years in electrical cost savings alone. But I believe it enhances the value of our home uh, to us, of our home to us now, right? And to any potential future buyer. My experience prompts me to make the following observation. Retrofitting extant homes of highly variable configuration with solar tiles and batteries entails operational inefficiencies that has constrained Tesla's progress in ways easily avoided while installing the same components in tracks of new houses under construction. I predict that Tesla will shift its solar contra uh, contracting focus from homeowners like me to new home contractors, offering solar system integration into ongoing new home construction, as has been mandated here in California, 
Good luck on your PTO. You deserve it. End quote. And thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. I remember our discussion last summer and the significant struggles you went through uh, getting through all that process. But kudos to you for keeping a, a good ab attitude and for persevering through that process. I've got to tell you, you're adding a ton of value to the community by being an early adopter. You're helping Tesla work out the uh, kinks in the process for retrofits. You're paying a premium for the product. Um, you're being a patient customer through all of this. And it's really going to be a benefit to those retrofit customers that come after you. Um, now that um, you've got the system in and you're kind of evaluating how the market should go, I think you're 100% uh, correct that new build uh New builds are going to have to be the focus of the Tesla business. And I think you're right. It's not just because of that solar mandate in uh, California, but it's also because of the inherent inefficiencies those projects have. Everything you mentioned, the structure's new, the structure's simple, there's no decking replacements or repairs required. The house, just from the start, is going to be designed with solar roof in mind. So everything about the process is going to be easier and more profitable. And because it's a mandate, it'll have to take priority over retrofits that you know, straight up don't have any impetus for that install other than perhaps an owner's desire to get the product. So here's to your project and to PTO and to me eventually joining the club. Let's see if we can get it done sooner rather than later, I hope. All right, Dwight Adams, he poses an interesting question. Let's read it. Quote, Aaron, here's a thought. Would Elon, in preparation for Mars development, consider a series of building homes or a neighborhood with no connection to the grid, using self-sustaining electric generation with solar and batteries, including energy efficient equipment like HVAC, et cetera, end quote. I mean, it's pretty clear, um, I think anyway, that Mars would have to run on electricity. I mean, right, you'll probably have electric vehicles. You're not going to have uh, the ability to use combustion in the same way that we use it now. But I don't know that it's clear what that source might be. You know, my immediate reaction was that solar panels might not produce enough on the Martian surface. And, you know, mostly because it's so much further from the sun. So doing a quick Googling, it auto-filled my question, of course. Um, and it, it pulled up this interesting resource. Let me show you. Um, uh, this is called First the Seed Foundation. Now, they aren't answering the same question, but they are in the same family, right? And it, honestly, it might even be more relevant since it's the self-sustaining bit we're after here. So they pose this question. They say, quote, uh, here up the top, is there enough light on Mars to grow tomatoes? End quote. Now, further down, uh, they point out the exact detail I was looking for. So let's get down here. Uh, here. The maximum solar radiance on Mars is about 900, sorry, 590 watts per meter squared compa uh, compared to about a thousand watts per meter squared at the Earth's surface. End quote. So if we had to ship enough solar panels to sustain a colony, we'd probably be taking up a lot of mass that could be better used, used elsewhere. And you know what has tremendous bang for the mass? A couple things, but fossil fuels specifically. And in this case, you know, of course it's a bit of a misnomer because they would be making methane for rocket return trips, they're not gonna be drilling for liquid dinosaurs, at least we don't think so right now. Um, and at first you might be thinking, wow, that's a bit of an irony, but it's gonna serve dual purposes. It's going to give us greenhouse gases to warm the planet, and it's gonna give it energy for sustaining the colony. So um, other than that, it might make sense to go nuclear also. You know, it's hard to say where this is gonna go, but humans have devised tons of ways to harness energy and Perhaps solar will be part of it, but I think we've got other sources that will better serve the mission, especially if you consider it on a mass uh, per energy basis. I mean, nuclear would be the most you know, efficient as far as that goes, and um, certainly fossil fuels you know, have that dual purpose. But thanks to Randy, Bob, and Dwight for your input. Let's hear from the rest of you, too. Send in your YouTube links. You can comment below. You can call 203-816-5150. Or you can email teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get into the news. So this episode, we have just a quick, uh, couple of quick stories uh, to cover. The first one we've got is from Solar Power World. Uh, they report on Virginia governor signing a new law. Let's read it. Quote, 
Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin signed a bill into law today that creates a property tax exemption for residential and mixed use solar energy systems up to 25 kilowatts. And quote, and this leaves out some key detail. I mean, it's not going to exempt you from paying any taxes, right? I mean, presumably it's like prorated to some percentage of the home value um, that your property can be taxed at. I would also expect it doesn't affect um, millage, which would be your school taxes, uh, any auxiliary services. Like our fire department taxes us separately from um, property taxes. But I would, of course, prefer to see this incentive cover battery storage, not just solar. Any consideration is appreciated, though. We're not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Next up, we've got a story from Global Newswire. They published a press release from Neo Volta. Let's read it. Quote. Scroll down to just a bit here. Neo Volta's NV14 cost per kilowatt hour was lower than 20 other listed brands in the report, beating out several high profile brands such as Sonen, Enphase Energy, LG Energy Solution, Generac, Panasonic, and SunPower. Tesla was the least expensive option on the basis of installed cost per kilowatt hour stored. Neo Volta came in a close second at only 2.6% higher than Tesla. The optional Neo Volta NV24 add-on battery, not included in the Energy Sage report, expands the NV14's high storage capacity from 14.4 kilowatt hours to 24 kilowatt hours, which makes it an even more cost-effective option than the Tesla Powerwall, end quote. And this is a lithium iron phosphate or LFP chemistry. Um, where the Tesla Powerwall is a lithium ion chemistry. So let's not forget that. Now, once Tesla um, you know, shifts over to LFP Powerwalls, this should move back to Advantage Tesla. But in the meantime, you know, it's really great, honestly, to see more battery options at better prices. The more competition, the better for consumers. Bring it on. Next up, we have an article from uh, howstuffworks.com. Now I've been a huge fan of them and their podcast for tons of years. You might know, um, um, stuff you should know. Great podcast. Uh, and it's audio format, which is, I think pretty great. I've even gone to one of their live, um, uh, events. I mean, it was a couple of years back now when I was living in Manhattan and that was a lot of fun. We did like a trivia night. It was, it was super baller, but they do a great overview of the virtual power plant and its potential role in the U S electrical grid. Let's take a look I say, quote, one of the big challenges that U.S. utility companies face is the demand for electricity isn't constant. Instead, it goes up and down, generally dipping in the nighttime hours and rising during the day, especially on hot days when residents are cranking up the air conditioning in their homes. The electric companies that supply the power must be able to cope with those fluctuations and meet the peak demand. Traditionally, that's required them to either build a lot of expensive coal or gas or nuclear electrical generating plants, or else buy energy from other suppliers when they need it. But these days, some utility companies are looking at less expensive and potentially more environmentally friendly solution. We're talking about virtual power plants, end quote. And when they're talking about virtual power plants, they're really talking about batteries. I love their diagram. Uh, go check it out. I've got a link in the description, of course. It shows the different uh, participants in the energy market. And interestingly, there are only two classes of um, outputs, even though there's a ton of classes of inputs. And what is really interesting about the diagram is that the central service, that's the virtual power plant, it has no actual assets. It is only a service. It aggregates, you know, the, and controls the flow of electrons, you know, from consumer, uh, from uh, generator to consumer. But, you know, saying it out loud, it definitely gets the investment opportunity spidey sense tingling. Uh, not advice for sure, but super interesting to think about. And, you know, this article is a really great way to get educated. So go read it again. Link in the description. All right. Next, we've got one from the Financial Times. Uh, this happens to be behind a uh, power wall. Uh, sorry, a paywall. Uh, but it does talk about Panasonic's uh, strategy to diversify away from Tesla. And this is what they put in the article. I'll just um, I'll read it from here, though. For Panasonic, the battery represents an opportunity to diversify its client base from Tesla. And this is quoting one of the. Um, uh, work, uh, one of the management at Panasonic. The 4680 is second to none in terms of performance and cost. Manufacturers other than Tesla will eventually adopt it, said uh, Kusumi. Uh, he added that investment pledge for EV batteries and other growth areas would, quote, probably not be enough to meet worldwide demand, end quote. So 
I have some bad news for Panasonic. There ain't nobody putting engineering time into the 4680 other than Tesla. In order to make that possible, the potential customer would need to purchase a sample run for testing and validation, but Tesla's gonna swallow up every last cell before they can be tapped off the line. So I'm not saying this investment isn't gonna be good for Panasonic. It's gonna be great, but their only customer is gonna to continue to be Tesla for a very long time. You know, the go-to-market strategy for other EV makers is to secure their own supply by co-owning the production capacity. Um, I expect that the production capacity they invest in will be more homegrown battery expertise. Um, and inevitably that ends up taking a little bit of a different direction. Um, the one exception I can think of you know, perhaps Tesla starts selling powertrains to other companies. I don't know. I would say, though, that would technically be other automakers, but Tesla will still be Panasonic's lone customer for sales if they're the ones that are pulling them uh, into packs and, uh, you know, plugging them into powertrains. Um, but even if that happens, that's not going to happen until, like, what, the 2030s? Maybe? I don't know. But... When I went to read this article, there was something else that was super interesting that happened. Uh, in order for me to read the article, they had me complete a seven question survey on child sleeping habits. Now I hate filling out surveys and I'm sure the rest of you do too, but I also hate paying for news content. So I completed the survey to get access to the article. And this is a really cool business model. Uh, whomever came up with it deserves, I think, a firm, hand, a firm handshake. I think this is gonna be um, you know, a shift in online content. Uh, it reminds me actually a bit of CAPTCHAs where human input's used for dual purpose, right? For security and for content classification. And I mean, you guys know, YouTube does this for video content, um, but the Financial Times model, if they can get payment in the form of market data, this is, I think, pretty interesting and something really smart. I, I think we're gonna see a lot more of it, which probably means it's gonna get really annoying, but it's got potential to help content creators get value outside of you know, platform aggregators like I use, you know, uh, Google News to get these alerts. So I thought it was something that was worth pointing out. Uh, but that'll do it for news. Let's take another quick break. When we come back, we'll get into the featured video. I am still looking at alternatives to solar. I'm sure many of you fall down this rabbit hole, not just me. Um, and this video explores some nuclear options. And this is another video from Matt Farrell at Undecided. Go subscribe if you haven't already. This video mentions ex SpaceX engineer starting a company called Radiant. And he gets into the potential micronuclear might have in place of large nuclear plants that have been coming offline in recent years. Let's take a look. In the US, former SpaceX engineers have launched the startup Radiant. They're developing a micronuclear reactor rated at one megawatt that could provide power for 1,000 homes without needing an external water supply. The microreactor uses helium for cooling and has remote monitoring and maintenance functions, which reduces the risk of damage. The Radiant has received $1.2 million from private investment. However, the technology is still patent pending, so there isn't much technical information and specifications available to the public yet, so we couldn't find more details there. So as exciting as all of that is, what's holding all of this back? Why not just go nuclear? The main challenges surrounding the SMR market are related to complicated licensing and regulatory guides, codes, and standards of practice, and legal frameworks around the globe. But beyond the regulatory challenges, there's also the cost. While conventional nuclear power has a levelized cost of electricity, or LCOE, ranging from $131 to $204 per megawatt hour, SMRs have an LCOE of $120 per megawatt hour for a typical market in the US, Europe, or Japan. Now, this figure is lower than traditional reactors, but still much higher than the LCOE for thorium reactors, which reaches about $53 per megawatt hour with a 30 year lifespan. On the flip side, the ability to incrementally add modules to an installation reduces both upfront investment and capital risk of SMRs compared to other nuclear technologies. However, compared to solar, wind, and hydro, you're looking at something in the range of $26 to $50 per megawatt hour. Even wholesale solar plus battery systems are in the range of $85 to $158 per megawatt hour. So nuclear isn't the slam dunk there either. Yeah, it's not at all a slam dunk. And you know what? Economics will almost drive these, almost always drive these decisions. And there are a couple of mentions of thorium, which uh, we should probably look more closely at. But what I'm looking for is Mr. Fusion, right? 
that's what powered the DeLorean and Back to the Future. I want my garbage to fuel that reactor and I don't want to share it with anybody. <laughs> Wasn't that the promise of this, you know, nuclear age? Sadly, we seem to be far from the hopeful future, but we'll march forward with solar and higher efficiency. So let's go through the production numbers really quickly. Uh, you can see some good production numbers uh, from our system over the last, you know, few days. Uh, today, it's looking okay. But yesterday, boom, almost 75 kilowatt hours, which is awesome. Now, we haven't turned on um, the air conditioner or the pool pump yet, so we're still generating way more than we use. Uh, you can see um, in our home consumption, you know, we're only consuming about 25 kilowatt hours, even though we're generating, you know, far in excess of that. And then if we go over to um, the brother-in-law system, uh, you can see that they're still out producing us on average. Uh, today, they're going to, you know, they're already over, well over 20 kilowatt hours. Yesterday, they reached nearly 80 kilowatt hours. I mean, really, really great. But they're no longer nearly double our numbers like they were before. And then if we look at um, their monthly generation so far, that's one megawatt hour. And if we go back to the uh, Tesla app, was that the... Um, it was already showing the monthly number. I wish I just left it. So we go from day to month. And we can see, you know, we're not too far back. We're only about 20% back. So you remember we were almost 50% what their production was, um, you know, as we were coming into the Equinox. Anyway, um, uh, what I really wanted to do, though, and um, this is something I've been thinking about a long time, was compare our overall production and utilization uh, with Kevin Giasulo. He's got a solar roof system also. It's about twice the size of ours here. It's 22 kilowatts, uh, where ours is 13 kilowatts. Uh, he's got four power walls. We've got two power walls. And here are compa uh, comparisons on a best possible day in April, uh, pretty close to the Equinox. And you can see, uh, if I bring that up on Kevin's side, um, specifically his production, his production is monster. It's over 100 kilowatt hours of production, almost 120 kilowatt hours. I mean, ours is respectable, you know, at 80, 60 and 80. Um, and if we take a look at the battery graph, you can see that our total usage dropped to only 47%, which is great, right? Uh, we haven't yet turned on our AC though. So this is a little bit better than what we'll get later in the year once we start uh, air conditioning and pool pump. But checking out Kevin's battery graph, it's even crazier. I mean, he's only dipping down to about 85% of total battery capacity overnight. Now, looking at these graphs, you might be tempted to think we've both purchased too much battery and you'd be wrong. <laughs> so give me one day of low production and I am tapped out. Even now uh, where I'm not using AC. Uh, Kevin's only got a couple of days reserve, you know, but he's not... Um, you know, getting very low in his consumption yet. So we're, we're going to have to see how it goes over the summer. Uh, it looks very promising, I'm not going to lie. So we'll keep an eye on the system, see what the picture looks like. And a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, we have an electric car. Kevin has no electric car yet. Uh, we have a pool pump. More on that in a future episode. Kevin does not have a pool pump. So there are significant production and consumption differences between his system and our system. But we've definitely got something in common with someone that's watching the video. So you can get an idea of what to expect if you put in your solar roof system, what you might uh, produce over a year and how that might relate to your consumption uh, depending on how um, your home is accessorized. So now I've followed up with Tesla on correcting my inverter re-engagement timeout. No update yet, so not able to book the witness test. PTO remains elusive from now, uh, for now, but Kevin did, uh, Suggest that I get aggressive. So what does that uh, be? Aggressive. Be, yeah. So that will do it for episode 56 of the Tesla Power Podcast. I want to say thanks very much for watching. And if you would, please use my referral code. You'll save $500 on a solar roof, $300 on solar panels. You can go to ts.la slash Aaron62310 to place your order. And as always, I'm Aaron Brady, your Tesla Residential Energy Community Organizer. Let's do this again on the next video.